<laughs> nice to see you here tonight. Just before I introduce our country director, who's going to say a few words of introduction, I'd like, like to tell you about two upcoming events, the last two talks in English that we've got for this um, academic year. So we have the photographer and photojournalist Bruce Frankel, who's going to give a talk on his work as a photographer and photojournalist on the 11th of May. And then we have the writer, Jake Lamar, who's also a professor of creative writing at Seals Boat. And he's going to be giving a talk on the creative process, his experience of a writer as an American living in Paris, and his experiences um, teaching and writing on the 8th of June. So those are the next and last two in the series of talks in English that we have for the year. Um, and if you'd like to find out about those, if you don't know already, the best way is to um, join our newsletter through our website. So sign up to our newsletter, then you'll get informed about all the different types of events that we do. Or like us on Facebook or Instagram, and you'll be sure to find out. Okay, thank you. So the talk will last, you know, sort of 30 minutes or so. There'll be questions and answers afterwards, and then you're very welcome to stay and have a drink and continue the conversation in English afterwards. <laughs> okay, so without um, further ado, I'd like to introduce our country director, and I'm going to say a few words. Thank you, Phil, and thank you, everyone. And it's a little bit blinding, so I've got. It is. Would you like? No, no, no. It's fine for it's me fine because nice it's, all, it's kind of nice. Because because it's I don't absolutely, it's great. It's, it's great. It's, it's great. It. Yeah, it's great. So we'll try to do that. Just bear with me if I miss a few, a few words. So first of all, thank you for joining us this evening. I'm glad we've got a mix of, of staff and. And, and people who do our courses and people maybe from our embassy colleagues and others. We're really delighted to have you here. If this is your first time here, um, you'll know that this is a terrific series that Phil leads and that is part of our activities both in our English teaching center but also as part of our cultural activities um, that we make up. And I really want to thank Phil for, for organizing this sure, and a variety of topics across the year. Um, for those who are here tonight for the first time, of course, the British Council, maybe you know it, but maybe you don't. I'll just quickly kind of give you the, the background that we're the International Organization for Cultural Relations, Educational Opportunities for the UK. So we actually do all the complementary work in arts and education, cultural events, and connecting people. We do the English teaching and the, and the skills recognition work. So some of the people call it exams, but it's actually to give people something that, that's demonstrable of the skills they've acquired. And we do this by bringing people and institutions together. So evenings like tonight and other kinds of convening things, we create partnerships. In our case here, we tend to do much of that with the France and the UK, but I'm going to answer a little question that was just asked by our uh, eminent speaker this evening about what else we do. We do do it with many other um, uh, nationalities, both around the world, but in the countries where we operate. Um, next year, here in France, we celebrate our 80th year. So it's not only the 2024 Olympics, and we've got the Rugby World Cup, and all these other activities happening, but as part of celebrating that 80th year, we're going to have a big spotlight on culture, which is an activity we'll have running across France, and here, where we're bringing together different um, UK, France organizations, there will be arts exhibits, there will be dance, there will be theater, so there's a lot of things that are coming up, and we hope that you'll want to be part of that as well. I think what inspired me about this talk this evening, um, when Phil was mentioning it, is the fact that you know it wasn't obvious in the beginning why do a talk about Ukraine. You've seen, you all signed up based on the um, you know, what is Ukraine and does it, what does it mean to be Ukrainian? But actually, that's very important to us because among the things that a cultural organization does is works across all different areas of culture. And we were very proud, for example, this year to host our Ukrainian colleagues when they needed a place to come and work and be safe. And in particular, we had our cultural colleagues who had been developing a UK, Ukraine event that would be a sort of season of, of artistic and cultural events, and that had to be cancelled for obvious reasons. And we were the place that, that um, they came. And that gave us an opportunity to also learn from what they were doing that we're putting into the program that I just described for next year. But very importantly, even um, the other role that we can play is in areas such as the UK and France just had a summit, an international summit. 
And what we did there was to identify areas where we can collaborate and cooperate together. Obviously, we did a lot of that in arts and cultural activities, which I'm happy to tell you more about as well, but also in English language. And among them, things like, how do we work together in areas like Ukraine, in Russia, in what's going on in the eastern part of Europe right now? How do we collaborate together around the world? And what are some of the things that we can align ourselves around? And Ukraine was one of the things that they did decide to do a lot of, um, I would say, identifying across the streams of work, areas that the UK and France can actually collaborate together, and institutions like ours can do that with our counterparts, Institut Francais, uh, and others. So it's actually very material for us to understand what is Ukraine, what does it mean to be Ukrainian? What does it mean to be British? What does it mean to speak English? All of these are the kinds of questions that really are important about identity, how we identify with others, and how we, we can actually collaborate together to make uh, for a better world. Um, I could go on about some of the aspects of why this is important for us, but I think one of the things I really wanted to pull out was um, that, and if I may um, kind of make reference to the little booklets that you have, can, can I call that a booklet, I guess? It's a leaflet or a booklet? It's a booklet. Um, mm -hmm. that I, I was really inspired to learn that you know, these kind of came out of a set of handbooks that were prepared after uh, the Second World War to really, in different countries, to, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have social media, we didn't have ways to really try to understand places the way we can today. So for all those who were having to make decisions or work in these contexts after World War II, these leaflets and booklets had been kind of prepared for the elites and for those who would be working there, and they were, you know, sort of um, required reading to get oneself up to speed and to be able to operate in these environments. And it was in this spirit, I believe, that you decided, or you let, that you created this one, um, uh, which, you know, has, has kind of become the booklet that um, gives us the insight of that aperçu, as we say in French, of what it is um, to be in Ukraine and the statehood. And so I think when organizations like ours that were sort of just coming out of those periods of the war were trying to serve our role, one of the things you want to do is continually be updating that. So I know this is an updated version, for example, of what we might have seen um, maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, so just to tell you very briefly, we've seen a little bit about what I think the, the expert report that you're going to talk about, um, Paul Bogoshi, is that you're a professor of history and of political science. So by taking those two and combining them, you're really giving us two different um, strands uh, to take a lens at this particular question. And this is at the University of Toronto, where you hold the endowed John Yeroko Yaremeko, I've completely botched that, so please do correct that for me, Chair of Ukrainian Studies. You're the author of over 40 books, including Historical Atlas of Central Europe, The Roots of Ukrainian Nationalism, and the History of Ukraine, the Land and Its Peoples, the bless this blessed land, Crimea and the Crimean Tatars, and Jews and Ukrainians. So if there's anyone who knows about this subject, whom we can learn not only from in terms of what it means to be Ukraine and Ukrainian, but where we can maybe pose a few questions at the end to you that may be sitting in the back of our minds, we thank you for taking the time to be here today with us and to share your thoughts. So thank you. Bye. I was debating on whether to sit down or stand up, so I'm going to start to sit down, and if I get tired, then I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to start to stand up, and if I get tired, I'm going to uh, uh, to uh, sit down. I find it fascinating uh, the reference, without knowing uh, the origin of this uh, pamphlet that is being handed out, or actually correctly called a handbook, because you mentioned World War II. Well, the actual model for this is related to where we are. That after World War I, with the collapse of all of the empires, and not only the transformation of Europe, but Africa, uh, the Middle East, uh, far Asia, the British, being the British, 
very wisely had their historical section of the Foreign Office prepare no less than 186 handbooks for all of these places of the world, for whom? For their experts who came with the diplomats to the Paris Peace Conference, Versailles, Trianon, Saint-Germain, uh, Neuilly, uh, to be prepared to literally redraw the map of Europe, and certainly the map of Europe and the Middle East. It's all of these countries that came into being didn't exist before, like Iraq, Iran, etc. These were all drawn. Uh, and it was the British who prepared this series of handbooks. And when I was uh, preparing to do this, also in a legal context, because it was a section based on the second expert report to the International Court of Justice uh, related to Ukraine's suit against the Russian uh, Federation of today for its occupation of Crimea and for its violation of human rights of the ethnic Ukrainians and, uh, uh, and, uh, and Crimean Tatars. It's before the court as we speak. In fact, the hearings finally after three years are taking place in June next month. For the month after. So that's the origin of this, and when you now mention this in the context of World War II, we were spot on. Uh, this, is, this is the kind, it's a handbook. I always forget that that's what I wanted to. And you have it here together with another, uh, this is kind of explanation that one needs to do, uh, and, and a kind of one of these cards that people who use modern technology will understand it better than me, uh, and namely that. Uh, one of the functions, one of the activities I do is I represent an organization called the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter, which is based in Toronto, and several of the publications that deal with that topic, including Jews and Ukrainians, are on that uh, card, and so you can make use of it. So, I'm going to try, excuse me, I'm going to try to speak as, as uh, briefly as possible, as a professor can. <laughs> Many of you are sitting in the audience and understand a pedagogue, so you can judge me uh, because I have a feeling, as was alluded to already, that there may be some questions. So I'm going to try to be as brief as possible. So, what is Ukraine? It's a pretty banal question, right? Uh, well, why are we even posing the question? Well, for obvious reasons. The, this unknown land has been thrust uh, into the consciousness of the world, unfortunately for the wrong reasons, but uh, this is how it happens. Uh, Ukrainians always wanted to be known. Well, now they are. But just because one hears about Ukraine and Ukrainians, doesn't mean that one understands uh, some of the issues of where this place is and who these people are. Now, uh, two basic things have evolved during this crisis, or I should say very concretely the second phase of the war that began in 2014. In 2022, it's the second phase of this war. And the reason why it is in many ways so confusing, or sometimes confusing for people, is because the propositions that have been put forth uh, by the power that has uh, prompted and motivated and caused the crisis that we have is that. Uh, According to, and this is made very clear and over and over clear, according to the leader of that country north of Ukraine uh, called Russia, uh, Ukraine is not a real country. What is this? This is a country that, first of all, it may be real now, but it just came into being in 1991. 
It was only because of the collapse of the Soviet Union. It, it has no uh, long-standing historical context behind it or tradition behind it. And then the other proposition that has been put forth uh, by Putin and the Rusimir or Russian world view is the uh, you know, Ukrainian. What, what, what is this? It's related to a name of a country that only just recently came into being. But many, if not a lot of Ukrainians speak Russian. Uh, and that they feel more comfortable either speaking Russian, identifying as Russian. So this Ukrainian, it's just kind of almost like a nominal descriptor. Fortunately or unfortunately, I would say unfortunately, many people outside of Ukraine, including throughout Europe, have often the same views. You know, what, what is this Ukraine? We've heard of it before. Uh, it's kind of a vague identity. And so, and, and another problem that comes up in this regard is that many people assume, many of you are language teachers here, and many people assume automatically that the language you speak is your identity. Uh, automatically. Well, so now let's look at these briefly, these two propositions that negate the existence of a country called Ukraine and a people called Ukraine. Uh, how do we respond to this? Actually, I also want to suggest something here. I put forth the two propositions of the enemy, and I'm not here to argue against the enemy in this particular equation. There's, there's no need to argue. Just because one view is out there doesn't mean that it needs to be argued against, and I'm not about to argue against it. I'm just putting on the table uh, what reality is. Uh, and then you can take it or leave it or ask questions about for me to confirm why that reality is the way it is. So the first proposition, Ukraine is not a real country. It just came into being in 1991. Well, actually, the idea of statehood on the territory of Ukraine, at one level, we can talk about it going back to prehistoric times, that is, uh, already uh, the first state that was created on the territory of Ukraine, something called the Bosporian, Bosporian Kingdom, I'm not going to go into these details. It's related to the settlement of Greeks and Romans in the Crimean Peninsula and southern Ukraine uh, in the centuries just before the Common Era or the birth of Christ in the centuries after. More important, and then of course there was this medieval entity. Some of you may have heard about it, uh, Kievan Rus. Uh, of course, in certain people's terminology, Kievan Russia. Uh, but this was a medieval entity uh, that existed roughly from the 9th to the uh, 14th century. But more important in terms of something that was actually Ukrainian, based on the territory of Ukraine and formulated as an entity that wanted to exist, sometimes in alliance with other countries, but mostly wanting to have its own Autonomy. And this was created way back in the year 1649. So one can talk about the beginning of Ukrainian state in the middle of the 17th century, not in 1991, not in the beginning of the 20th century, in the 17th century. And this, and, and this uh, entity was called the Cossack State. Uh, some of you may have heard of the Zaporozhian Cossacks and Taras Bulba. Uh, if you've seen films, etc., this is the first Cossacks were actually in Ukraine, not the Don Cossacks or the East. But they created the state as long ago as 1649, sought various alliances with neighboring countries, but it existed in one form or another throughout the rest of the 17th century and much of the 18th century. Uh, after that, it ceased to exist, but the idea of Ukrainian statehood remained in the minds of the intelligentsia and 
national awakeners and national builders in the course of the 19th century. And finally, after World War I, in which the catastrophe of many of these empires ceased to exist, the question rises again about these Ukrainians. They were already there. And during the period, and let's see if I can do this, but one of those maps, or all of these maps, are in your little handbook. Well, look at that. <laughs> I have achieved something. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is no exaggeration. I have never in my entire career ever used PowerPoint. And this is a first. And that's because you're four computers. We will have a discussion about this later. <laughs> But, but no, you just that, that I can finally do it at my age. Yes, you're good. Because we actually, we were going to engage someone else to push the button. And I figured, you know, maybe it's a little too. Let's see. So good. All right. Uh, let's not get on to a tangent. But nonetheless, um, so during this revolutionary period, which followed World War I, there were no less than three different, four different republics that came into being Ukrainian Republic, <coughs> Ukrainian National Republic, the West Ukrainian National Republic, which is the western part of the country, um, a Ukrainian state called the Hetmanet, which was renewing the tradition going way back to the 17th century. And then there was a Soviet Ukrainian republic that came into being. So that during this period of 1917 to 1918, and actually continuing as, uh, into 1921, we have four different Ukrainian republics. Why? Because the idea of Ukrainian state would was well embedded in the population. What form that was going to take, whether in terms of the politics, the alliances, that's a different story. But the idea, the concept that the statehood for Ukraine, well embedded. Then on the, and then of course, as a result of that, see now if you see what happens as you get linked to this stuff, look at the map, I don't know. <laughs> Dependent, right? Right? It's terrible. So we'll leave, it, we'll leave this one up here for now. My point is that during World War II, on the eve of World War II, uh, there was another small Ukrainian-oriented republic in the form of the eastern part of Czechoslovakia. During World War II was proclaimed. But also throughout this whole period, there was Soviet Ukraine. And many argue that, well, you know, Soviet Ukraine, this was just a regional area of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union wasn't a real federation, so on and so on. What it did have characteristics of a distinct statehood. Not many people know, from 1920 to 1923, Soviet Ukraine had embassies in various countries, and various countries, including Britain, had an embassy in Kiev, because they recognized that this component of later and totally subordinated to the Soviet Union was, at least until 1923, a functioning distinct entity. After World War II, this Soviet Ukraine, as Soviet Ukraine, continued to exist, and for different reasons, became actually a founding member of the United Nations. So from 1946 in San Francisco, Soviet Ukraine, together with Bela, Bela, uh, Bela Russia, uh, Soviet Belarus and of course the Red Russian Federation were all legitimate members. Ukraine had its own foreign mission to the United Nations. So this idea of Ukrainian statehood, even within the framework of the Soviet Union, continued to exist. So when 1991 came along and the Soviet Union collapsed, Ukraine didn't drop out of somewhere. It had this long tradition of statehood. So that's proposition one that I'm leaving with you. Proposition two, identity. What is a Ukrainian? According to many people and, and the, the, the world view uh, of uh, Putin's Russia, is that these people are just really a branch of Russians, traditionally in the 19th century called by them little Russians. Of course, Ukrainians took as an insult, but that was their formal designation during the period of the Russian Empire. Uh, 
And so let's begin first by a brief description of the population of Ukraine. Ukraine is, as I would like to say, a normal country, a typical European country, and there's no European country with the exception of Iceland, maybe Ireland, in which there are not more than one people living in it. Every country in Europe is multicultural and multinational. And I'm not talking here about immigration. I'm talking about it's composed of peoples who have lived for centuries and millennia on that territory, brought under the hegemony of a given state. We're in the British Embassy, or the Embassy Council, or whatever it's called, what is it? the British Council, pardon, pardon. Um, the British Council, but in the context of, of Great Britain, uh, you know, not everyone in Great Britain is English. That's the obvious. Well, this is also for this country, France, where we have, aside from French, we have Breton, Occitan, Basques, Alsatians. There are even some Flemish up there in the north, uh, the northwestern corner of the country. By the way, there's even a Luxembourg minority in France, which no one has ever heard about, just north of Metz. Uh, so, France, like many of these countries, uh, there's a small Catalan population in France. I say this all the time, especially when I'm in France, because just to needle our French friends, uh, <laughs> that they are as multicultural as any other country, uh, a place like Germany. Right? As people know that in Germany there are the uh, Lusatian Sorbs, uh, a Slavic population who lives in the east. Uh, North Frisians who live in the northwestern part, north, north, in northwestern part of Germany. So, in that context, Ukraine is like the rest of Europe, and it's compri comprised of numerous peoples who have been living on the territory of Ukraine forever, almost. The largest groups, of course, are ethnic Ukrainians, ethnic Russians. But then there are a whole host of others, Poles, Jews, Moldavians, Romanians, Bulgarians, etc., Hungarians, Armenians, Greeks. In the old days, a lot of Germans, including Mennonites. Uh, so it's a normal polity, like any polity. When nation states were being formed, and the idea in the 19th century, among people who didn't yet have their own states, those leaders usually associated statehood with a given nationality. Namely, if you were going to create out of the old kingdom of Bohemia a Czech state, it should be made up of only Czechs, even though there were about three point two million Germans living in the Sudetenland all around, but people are thinking, oh, this is a Czech state. Czech state in the sense of an ethnic state, associated with a particular ethnolinguistic group. But then there are other experiences, France is a good example, where you're creating a civic state, where you may have an identity called French, because that's the, the, the identity of the civic administrative entity with boundaries, but within there you have French of various backgrounds. And so similarly in, in a place like Ukraine, uh, you can and still have all of the citizens of the country are Ukrainians because they have that citizenship. But there may be Ukrainians of Polish background, Ukrainians of Jewish background, Ukrainians of Crimean Tatar background, Ukrainians of Russian background, Ukrainians of ethnic Ukrainian background. Namely, there's a distinction between ethno-linguistic identity and civic state identity, or citizenship. And very often people mix these things up. Namely, well, if you don't speak Ukrainian and then you're not an ethnic Ukrainian, if you don't speak Ukrainian, then you're not Ukrainian. Well, this is not right, actually. And 
The other problem that derives from this is that living for such a long period of time within a country that found itself within the framework of a, lo a larger country, in this case Ukraine, within the framework of the Soviet Union for much of the 20th century, you had another kind of state identity, and that is a Soviet identity. And we refer to people who have developed a Soviet identity that is not based on any particular ethnic group, but being Soviet citizen, a Soviet new man and woman, uh, as Sovoks. And these are the kind of people who really regretted the end of the Soviet Union. And in Ukraine, many of these people were Russian speakers, whether they uh, were of Ukrainian ethnic background, Jewish ethnic background, or Polish ethnic background, they were Russian speakers, but for them, their ethnic identity and language was less important because the language that they used was Russian, this was the most important thing, and they associated themselves with the Soviet Union. Every one of these republics in the Soviet Union had this kind of population which we call Soviets. Now we have an independent Ukrainian state, and this independent Ukrainian state is trying to create an a, a alternative to a Soviet identity, a Ukrainian civic identity. And this struggle, did, or the, the, this transformation that had not happened overnight. And since 1991, this process has been moving along slowly, but it has been helped by the several, in a sense, political revolutions that have taken place. Ukraine came into being in 1991. Most of the population, a good percentage of it, certainly in the East and South, are these Soviets. That is, Russian speakers who feel themselves part of this larger Soviet world. That begins to change in the armed revolution of 2004, when there was a regime change, we had more people, and certainly younger people, coming to the conclusion that they are, regardless of even if they're Russian speakers, they're identifying with a civic state. Mm -hmm. Then comes the second revolution of 2014, and the occupation and annexation of territory in that first phase of the current war by the Russian Federation of Eastern Ukraine and Crimea. This then transformed people and awakened them to the fact that their country, which now they consider Ukraine, is being threatened from the outside. And then lastly now we have the second phase of the war beginning in February 2022, which is the culmination in the sense of this process. Because now, as a result of this ultimate threat, people have now in Ukraine been transformed, really for the first time, into Ukrainians. That is citizens who not only know that they live in a land called Ukraine, but associate themselves with their state, primarily among the younger generation, but not only, and that they are willing to defend that state and die for it. And the rest of the world looks at this and says, wow. In a sense, the creation of a people and the idea of independent statehood and the feeling of this is the country to which you belong is a long process, a costly process, and really cannot be achieved until it goes through the crucible 
of revolution and the cost in human lives and sacrifice which we're seeing before our eyes. But this process of now, what is Ukraine? We know it. They know it. It has boundaries. It is clear. It is a state that has a long historical tradition. And what is a Ukrainian? It's every citizen of that country, regardless of their ethno-linguistic background, who feels committed to their state and are willing to defend it. And so, what we're seeing, which looks terrible, tragic, disgusting, has to do something new and something good. So let me stop here and, and answer any questions that you may have. Yeah, yes. What, um, what do they think they are? Mm -hmm. First of all, in terms of ethno-linguistic composition of Crimea, in this land, which had at the beginning of the 19th century been inhabited primarily by Crimean Tatars, uh, a, um, a, a, a Turkish people, that had their own state also uh, for many centuries. In the course of the 19th century, because of the policy of the Russian uh, uh, government uh, that wanted to russify this area, uh, enormous emigration of Crimean Tatars to various countries in the Balkans, and in particular to modern-day uh, Turkey, so that by the by the 20th century, the beginning of the 20th century, whereas at the at the, at, the, at the end of the 18th century, which is specifically 1783, when the Russian Empire annexed Crimea, destroyed its independence, 85% of the population of the Crimean Peninsula were Crimean Tatars. Uh, after the, so by the time of the 1920s and 1930s, uh, only 25%. Um, but that was also not enough for the Soviet Union because during the war, uh, the Crimea, Crimea was occupied by Nazi Germany, and after the war, Stalin uh, blamed the entire Crimean Tatar population for having allegedly co collaborated with the Nazi Germans, even though tens of thousands fought on the side of the Red Army, that didn't make a difference. It was the Stalinist principle of uh, uh, no people, no problem, uh, so on they the 28th, uh, 1944, uh, just picked up the entire 244,000 population of Crimean Tatars, and in the course of three days, shipped them all uh, to uh, Central Asia, primarily to Uzbekistan, and then there were no more Crimean Tatars in Crimea. Uh, and all that was left uh, were, was the Slavic population, and of the East Slavic population, Three quarters of it were uh, uh, Russians and about a quarter Ukrainians. And that was the situation uh, that, that obtained until the uh, 1980s. And in the 1980s, the Tatars pressed the changing and the de de devolving uh, Soviet Union to be able to return to their homeland. They didn't forget about their homeland. And so uh, they started slowly coming back from Uzbekistan but that process of return to the homeland increased uh, greatly during, after the independence of Ukraine. Uh, the independence of Ukraine in 1991 also allowed for a special autonomous republic for, of Crimea. It was the only non-centralized portion of the Ukrainian state. Uh, and that was the situation until uh, 2014 when, when uh, the Russian Federation occupied Crimea, um, arguing that the local Russian population wanted to return to 
uh, to Russia. And so that was the, uh, that's the situation of the ethnic composition uh, of Crimea. And the situation today is one in which uh, the Crimean Tatars and all of their institutions uh, have been abolished by the present Russian Federal Republic. And a large number of Crimean Tatar leaders have sought refuge in Ukraine. And Crimean Tatars in general have become, uh, are in the forefront in many ways of this civic identity that I was speaking about, of the feeling that Ukraine is their state. Uh, even though they're not ethnic Ukrainians, it's still their state, they live on the territory. So that's the situation. Uh, in terms of Crimea. Yes? Uh, well, uh, from what I understand... Oh, pardon, I have to... I'm um, deaf. From what I understand, uh, Ukraine is like a melting pot, a melting, uh, pot of uh, different ethnic minorities. Mm -hmm. And what I want to know if the fact that I saw many different ethnic minorities, mm -hmm. if they really feel like Ukrainian, because you know in other countries where you've got minorities, they don't always feel, um, well, say, French or whatever, and uh, so how can you be sure of that, that they really feel Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question was, is, it sounds like Ukraine is a melting pot. Uh, first of all, the term melting pot uh, is a misnomer for Ukraine, and it's a misnomer also for the United States, because that's where the term was usually applied, uh, with regard to the enormous immigration that came there in the, from the 1980s until World War I. Uh, there was never really a melting pot in the United States either, People, despite the fact that they Many of them, and certainly in the second generation, identified as Americans, they didn't give up their cultures. Their, their cultures still didn't go away. As we know, if you visit the United States, you still have Italian Americans and, and uh, you know, whatever version. Um, so, uh, Ukraine, as, as uh, uh, many of these countries in Europe, uh, is not a melting pot uh, in the sense of these populations of various ethno-linguistic backgrounds. By the way, I deliberately don't use the term minority. I don't like the term minority. It's, it sends the wrong message. We just have various peoples uh, in, in who, are, who are all equal. Uh, uh, not one is any more equal than the other. And, and so these traditions, uh, uh, so within Ukraine, um, you have these various peoples. And many of them have been allowed also during the Soviet times as well, and during Ukrainian times, if they live in concentration somewhere to maintain their own language and they have their own schools. So for instance, there is a Hungarian minority of about 150,000, 120,000, 120, in one particular part of, of Ukraine, and they live on the border of Hungary, but they are in Ukraine, and so they have their own Hungarian language schools. They identify as Maidas, but they live in Ukraine. And so similarly, you had this for a long time amongst Poles. You certainly had it earlier for Germans. Um, and certainly you have it for Russians. Uh, and you had it for Crimean Tatars. So, uh, however, there are normal assimilation processes in which if you live long enough in the country, you know, you, all the efforts sometimes to maintain languages and cultures uh, are superseded by the people themselves who want to join the larger polity, whether that is on linguistic grounds or identity grounds. Of course, on linguistic grounds, we have the great example of Ireland, where you know, the greatest, all the great Irish nationalists and writers and so forth, they, they use English. Uh, but they're Irish. <laughs> uh, so, um, but in the, in, the case of, of, uh, in the case of Ukraine, uh, the next question that you posed how can one determine that these people of people living in Ukraine of various ethno-linguistic background have bought into the idea of uh, 
a Ukrainian civic identity. Well, ironically, in the, the 2014 uh, uprising, which was known as the Revolution of Dignity, and the, the taking place on the Maidan in Kiev, and then the government coming out and um, uh, trying to suppress the rioters, uh, just like you have on the streets, because you couldn't get here today. You've got rioters all the time in Paris because this is a city of professional uh, protesters. That's the national character of the French. Uh, <laughs> but uh, at least you don't have the police shooting them. Mm -hmm. right? Whereas uh, in 2014, the government, who was led by a man named Yanukovych, called out the police and they shot, you know, over two days, a hundred protesters. The first one on the Maidan that was shot was a Ukrainian of Armenian background. And little is known, but on the Eastern Front in the war that began in 2014 and continues today, not the vast majority of soldiers in the Ukrainian army fighting against Russia, the vast majority of soldiers in the Ukrainian army are Russian speakers. But they're Ukrainians. They feel themselves Ukrainians. So there are numerous indications of the strength of a civic identity that supersedes uh, an ethno-national one. Uh, and we, we can see this all the time. And as I said, you know, this was a slow process, but the tempo of that process has increased thanks to an external enemy. The best way to build solidarity is to have an external enemy. It was Lenin who said, you know, if we don't have an enemy, in order to be successful, we have to create an enemy, and then we have someone to fight against. We can create an enemy. Then our movement will be successful. <laughs> Sir. And, and I will come back to you. Do you think the West mm -hmm. is um, doing enough to support? Pardon? You? Do you think the West is doing enough to support Ukraine in the current war? I would say generally. Uh, I would say generally yes. Um, I, I would say generally yes. They they may be slow and careful, and in increments. The criticism could be look at, look at all the arms that have been are now given to Ukraine. Now, if that same amount of arms was given them to a year ago, it's quite likely that the balance and the amount of territory that the Russians hold now would be much less. But for all the political reasons and diplomatic reasons that we know, and the need for the givers to have to deal with their local populations, it's come, it came slowly, slower than expected, it's slower than it could have been, but it is there. And by the way, in this particular context, we look at this from a Ukrainian perspective and from a, a perspective of, of, uh, of people who just observe and are interested in political developments in the world, that the British have been, in a sense, the big surprise and the most remarkable. Considering the size of the country and considering um, uh, the amount of things that they can afford, the British have been very good. And of course, the Germans have been less effective. And we can go on and on. France, of course, is France. <laughs> I say that only a half jestingly. France is one of the most problematic countries in terms of recognizing the existence of peoples within other states. Now, the reason for that we can get into, and I have my views, but there's no question about it, that France traditionally has had no sympathy no sympathy whatsoever for the idea that Ukraine is a separate people and a separate nationality. 
And that is because France has been traditionally a uh, pro-Russian uh, country already from the 19th century. The Bridge of Alexander III uh, is a symbolic example of this. The French went out of their minds when Diaghilev brought the Ballet Luxe because now look at the greatness of Russian culture. Uh, modern art, which was as well developed in the Russian Empire as it was on the eve of World War I in Paris, except that the Russian Empire was mostly being done in Kiev, by the way. Um, uh, and uh, so the French, though, viewed all of this as Russia. The idea that somehow Russia would be broken up into these various nationalities is just something that they couldn't take. Uh, and we know the forms that it takes with your present, with the present leadership of this country, who likes to dally with and spend all their time with uh, Putin sitting at the other far edge of the table because Putin was really looking down at him. Um, but uh, so that's a problem. But the British know. The British are steadfast and known to be steadfast on this issue. Yes. Yeah. Well, actually, I think maybe France at the beginning wanted to favor peace rather than war. And that's what could have been maybe an option because if you always follow the United States, they always go for the war, you know. Uh, and uh, if you look at the century, there is more war actually from the United States, you know. And, uh, I mean, so there's there no military is, engagement yes, on the no part no of the United States. Sure, exactly. Uh, Just and no. this is why hey, right, maybe okay. you have to be careful. Maybe mm -hmm. they wanted, maybe, mm -hmm. well, it's, I'm not saying for sure, but they wanted to try to avoid that war, that uh, military mm -hmm. engagement. Yeah, okay. Well, obviously, one wants to try to avoid war, but when it is clear that avoidance is impossible, then you have to make a decision. And in the end, the French did make a decision, but it took, it took a long time to get there. And, and you know, France, France also has, a, 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 as we well know, a tradition of, remember that word, appeasement? Remember that 1938 thing done in Munich? in which the, the yeah. Prime Minister of France and the Prime Minister of Britain would do anything, anything to avoid war. You know, Hitler is a reasonable man. We just have to sit down and talk to him. And so, uh, you know, so that kind of attitude, uh, it, it, fine, but it can lead to problems. Uh, there was another question. Yeah, yeah, and I'm, 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 I'm just wondering if we can come back a little bit okay. to what makes Ukraine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, looking at your wonderful map, and looking how the looking at it's this color, map, it's color coordinated, and all of them are. <laughs> so I'm not sure at what point yellow and blue became the identity colors. But the question is more about: Is there anything because I've not visited, and some people may be Ukrainian or Russian or other border countries? Is there anything about the geography mm -hmm. that defines some of the things? I mean, we see these rivers, and we see some of those things, but. Mm -hmm. And I'll put out the contemporary right. one right. so we can see what it is. There it is today. Yeah? Okay, sorry. So can you can you give us a little geography lesson? Is there anything that other than the, um, you've described how the sort of identity with the civic mm -hmm. concept of Ukraine, is there anything about the sort of geographical concept of mm -hmm. Ukraine that plays into what that might be in one's mind? Um, I think I know where you're perhaps leading with the question, and the, the, and the only answer, I, I, and I, I think I would have to say, uh, no, it's not that geography doesn't have an impact on, on the historical development of the region, but, this, but the answer, a simple geographical lesson, Ukraine is geographically boring, <laughs> right? It is just this one flat land, uh, part of the Eurasian a plain which continues all the way from the east, and so all of this is just flat. And, and which is, in terms of historical development, yes, it, it, the flatness of it had great impact because there's no natural boundaries, none whatsoever. 
The only mountains are a small kind of cliffs here down the Crimean mountains. So the Crimea effectively looks like the French Riviera, where the mountains are, right? Or the Italian Liguria, mm -hmm. little settlements down on the bottom and then the cliffs. So that's what you have down here. And the only other real mountains are the Carpathian. But as you can see, both of them are on the total edge of the country. Uh, the rest is just an open uh, territory. How, how did you get to have U Ukraine out of this otherwise non-divided, non-descript geographical plane? What makes it different from Belarus or what makes it different from southern Russia, etc.? Uh, well, this, this has to do with uh, nationality building in the 19th century among many stateless peoples uh, in Europe, Central and Western Europe, as well as Eastern Europe, in which uh, part of that process was when the national intelligentsia dreamed up by themselves and self-designated people, uh, still done today, uh, who uh, decide that, well, we represent a given people, and uh, this people has a right to its own language and literature and culture, and maybe political autonomy, maybe independence, and where does this people live? And, and who defines who these people are? Uh, who defines what is a distinct language as opposed to some dialectal variant? Uh, well, it's these, this intelligentsia. And so modern day Ukraine actually is not terribly much different from ethnographic maps that were dreamed up by the Ukrainian intelligentsia at the end of the 19th century. It took some time to realize it politically, but that's, that's how Ukraine is different from Belarus, as an example, or from Russia. But geogra ge geography doesn't really tell us much here because it's just one flat plane. Okay. So, Yes, I would like to ask you a question about the, the Russian side. The Russian side, if you have any, any idea of that, because I was talking to a Russian the other day. Uh, a Russian friend and uh, he told me, okay, you might say that uh, war is bad, we're not uh, doing the right thing uh, in, uh, in Ukraine at this moment, but you can never say that Ukraine is not a Russia, and Ukrainians are not a Russians, mm -hmm. and uh, this, is, this area there is the source of our civilization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What did he mean? What does it mean? Huh? Okay. <laughs> well, you have, you're describing uh, through the prism of one person, your friend or not, or acquaintance, the quintessential attitude of Russians. Okay. And this attitude has been created ever since the Middle Ages. Namely, ideologists around the Tsars of Muscovy deliberately created the idea that all East Slavs, which in modern day terms are Russians, Belarusians, Ukrainians, and another small group called Carpathian Russians, all of these East Slavs are by religion Orthodox, belonging to the Eastern Christian Church, roots in Byzantium, present-day Istanbul, and the, the, the importance of religion as a unifying factor in national identity, in particular among the Russians, exceedingly important. And the argument was, is that the first state that existed among the East Slavs was a state called Rus, Rus is not Russia, however, Rus, and the center of this state called Rus was, of all places, Kiev, and very often in the historical literature one talks of a medieval state called Kievan Rus. You even have here in France a queen of France from the Rus, Anna, in the 11th century. Uh, and these ideologists 
hired by, usually clerics, of the church, supported must the growth of this small little city-state called Muscovy, and Muscovy then took on the mantle of the defender of all of the rules. They couldn't do it right away, it took them time, but the ideology they built already in the 14th century. And that ideology was that there is one Rus people, which they called, say, Russian, not Rus, and that this entity, this medieval entity called Kievan Rus, was the first Russian state and should be called Kievan Russia. And that ideology that began, as I said, among clerics, monks, in the 14th and 15th century, then in early modern times, that ideology was transformed into training in schools, and this became the official ideology of the Russian Empire. There is one people called Russian. Now they have some branches, right? They have these little Russians down there, they have these Belarusians, uh, and then of course they call themselves the Great Russians, modern day Russian, but they're really all one people. Uh, and that is embedded in the mind of all Russians. It is impossible for Russians to believe that these three components can be separated. This is Russia, this arm is Little Russia, and this arm is Belarus. What are you going to do? Cut off the arm? And then, you know, this is not possible. This is one entity. Now, we know that other peoples have had that attitude, right? But that's embedded in them to this day. And so any Russian you speak, what is this Ukrainian stuff? They tolerate it for a while, but now, of course, this, what I've just explained to you is the classic view of Russian ideologists in the late 19th century in Tsarist Russia, because Putin is the same view, but it's nothing new. He's just regurgitating things that were, that were already conceived in the 19th century. And the West, whether it's Britain or France or Germany, long ago bought into that and accepted it. For instance, it's not until we have to stop. I know no, this, is, this is very interesting, but I'll get there. But until, un, 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 until maybe a few years ago, if you pick up publications in Britain, they still use the term Kiev in Russia. Other scholars in the world got rid of it and went back to Rus, because that's the name. No, they couldn't get over it. And still in French, there's no difference between, they, they don't even have a word for Rus, because Rus is Rus. It's all Russia. Right, so the West bought into this ideology, Russian imperial ideology, continued, by the way, in another form by the Soviets, and then today by the Russian Federation. Yes, sorry. Could I just, uh, this lady here, that have to be the last question. Okay. Uh, you are asking uh, how to, to define Ukraine, or how Ukraine can be defined by themselves. We talked a lot about the, the Western part of Europe. What about, how would you classify the other countries worldwide? How, how do they consider Ukraine? Uh, I'm very sorry, I, I can't hear you. You're going to have to eat it. Ah, sorry. Yeah, okay. okay, excuse me. So, you, you highlighted uh, how to define Ukraine and how Ukrainians consider it themselves. How would you sort of, if possible, classify the rest of countries worldwide? How do they, do they consider Ukraine? Oh, the way, so how does the rest of the world look yes. at Ukraine? How, yeah. would you, how would you sort of um, distinguish some groups, like those that are neutral, mm -hmm. or are, are uh, considering the same you described, mm -hmm. and those that are against this vision, and mm -hmm. mm -hmm. how would you go that sort of Yeah, okay, good. I think things. the simple answer to that question is that most countries of the world have had no idea what Ukraine was. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's, that's to begin with. Yeah. Um, but, that has changed because it, it makes perfect sense. How, how can you know what Ukraine was? Up until 1991, it was the Soviet Union. And of course, in the rest of the world also, by the way, 
People never called, talked about the Soviet Union. Even then, it was just Russia. Everybody in the Soviet Union was Russian. Right, of course, there was not even any differentiation. Just simplification, simplification. So, there was really no knowledge about Ukraine. But, as a result of first independence, that started to change. Because there was a country called Ukraine. And by the way, you know how people learn about countries? Not through politics, and not through going to, to uh, you know, universities or, or schools. Talks. Huh? Talks. Talks. To what? No, no. You don't learn from people like me who write books. Who cares? They learn about countries through football. <laughs> you think I'm laughing? Well, there was no Ukraine, but then suddenly, when there's a, a team at you know an Olympic stadium marching out with a flag, oh wow, there's a country. Look, they got a team. And then that they're playing football and they win and they are in the World Cup and so this is how people's minds throughout the world become aware of something. And so again, it was a, it was a, it was a slow process, but it was a process that people knew about Ukraine. And then all you have to do is have this war, and then everyone in the world knows about Ukraine, no matter where you go. Now, whether the governments of those countries throughout the world have a sympathetic attitude toward Ukrainian independence or have a sympathetic attitude to supporting Ukraine when it's in danger as it now is, that is a different story. Mm -hmm. But awareness that Ukraine exists, that is now a given. Another one of the great achievements for Ukraine. By the way, just very briefly, and I'll finish here. Oh, yeah. I have one more question. And I get so I gave up. Yeah. Okay, but let, me finish, let me finish this one again. Yeah. Last night, when was it? Last night? Whenever it was. We were in London. And, see you moment. Extra question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to follow this brilliant lady's question with one that adds one more dimension that we know we want to hear from you. Has President Zelensky created a bit of Ukraine, both internally for Ukrainians and externally for this football kind of question? <laughs> One never knows what's going to happen tomorrow based on today and yesterday. There is no way that one would have ever expected that this television actor <laughs> who gets elected on a kooky platform <laughs> and who in those first years actually had a lot of advisors who were sympathetic to Russia and who and who were willing to work out all kinds of deals, certainly on the economic front, and even after the, well, the Minsk Accords that were supposed to regulate relations between these countries and resolve the problem of the occupation of certain lands already in 2014 by Russia, that didn't work. He was sympathetic toward that. And then what happened? They invaded. Nani, the guy, stepped up to the plate. The guy has become one of the most incredible leaders in the 21st century and has become an icon of defense of his own country. Now, 10 years ago, no way would even anyone remotely. But situations change people. So we can never know what's going to happen now based on, but no, we never can know what's going to happen in the future, even in the short term future, based on what we know now and what we think we know from based on the past. This guy has been absolutely remarkable. And without question, he has 
been one of the most important galvanizing features of pride and transforming those remaining uncommitted Ukrainians into being Ukrainians and fight and uh, defend their country. And lastly, a, a colleague of mine, a close friend of mine, was trying to set up some talk at Sciences Po. Right? So I always like to say that the best training for a leader in a democratic country is not to study political science and write a doctorate or become a lawyer. Actually, the best training is to be an actor. <laughs> I mean, look in the United States. Well, Ronald Reagan gets elected. Everyone's <laughs> laughing at America. That is dumb Americans. Look at it. They get, they've got an actor to become part. He became one of the great leaders. Right? Arnold so, Schwarzenegger. Pardon? Arnold Schwarzenegger. Schwarzenegger. Yeah, but he only ruled California. But nonetheless, of course we have examples of this. But I'm talking at a state level. And then we have this guy, which is, of course, is the craziest of all. He's an actor, and he becomes famous playing the role of a of a president of the country, <laughs> and now it becomes real. Why? Because a leader, their only job is to be charismatic, to galvanize populations, to make them feel comfortable and proud of themselves and proud of their country. And when they're under threat, then you really need this. All the other stuff is detail. But if you don't have, that's what a leader should be. And so, you know, working in Hollywood and on television is the greatest training. To wit, we now have two examples. No, the guy is unbelievable. He truly is. And Ukraine, it's again, it's Ukrainians, kooky people. I mean, this is what they produce. They die on the streets and they got an act to run the country. On that very profound note. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. We can continue the conversation.